The RC100 NVMe SSD and XS700 Portable SSD are both powered by Toshiba's Advanced 3D BICS flash memory, meaning you get solid state speeds at an affordable price. The XS700 is a wicked fast external drive with USB 3.1 Gen 2 via a Type-C connector, and the RC100 may be small, but its M.2 NVMe interface means sequential read and write speeds at well over 1000 megabytes per second. Click the sponsor link in the description to learn more. What's up guys, how's it going? And welcome back to another episode of Probing Paul. This is my monthly Q&A series and it's getting towards the end of July, so I better do my July one. This is episode number 26. So thanks to all you guys who are watching and if you've wanted to watch the old ones, there's all of the past Probing Pauls that I've done. I've been probed so many times now but it never gets old. All the questions from this episode were derived from last month's episode of Probing Paul, which was actually at the end of May, technically speaking, but not, let's not get too hung up on the schedule. First question is from the sycophant, uh, who says, hey, or the psychophant? I don't know. Anyway, hey Paul, simple question. Which internet connection are you sitting on? I don't usually sit on my internet connection that can be uncomfortable, but I assume you mean who provides my internet connection and maybe how fast it is. So uh, Frontier, Fios, I have fiber to the home here in Southern California, which is nice. And I'm currently paying for 100 up and 100 down, or at least that's what they tell me I'm supposed to get. So let's double check it here, real time, uh, with the Google internet speed test checker. Oh, look at that upload speed. That upload speed's looking nice. Gonna get a quick second opinion here by using Ookla's speedtest.net to do another speed test. And there you go, there's my current internet speeds, 100, a little over 100 down, uh, getting up towards 120 up, which is nice for uploading the YouTube videos, getting similar results from speedtest.net, so there you go. And yes, with fiber to the home, I could be getting much faster speeds than this, but you know, they make you pay more for more bandwidth, so for now, this is just fine for me. Next question from Ricky V. Hey Paul, I see lots of monitors in the background of your shooting space. Uh, I would like you to explain their uses, as well as how many computers that you keep in your shooting space. So I have lots of computers here at home, and I don't consider my setup here to be practical. I have more computers than I actually need, so I don't use them all all the time. Uh, but right behind me right now is Riptide, and that's still uh, in the process of getting set up. Uh, for my actual studio space here in the garage, I have three monitors and two computers. Uh, the computer there in the back is Arctic Panther, which I built uh, over the course of several years has many different iterations. There's a long video series on that one. Monitor here is the Acer Predator X34. I use that as my primary gaming monitor and uh, Arctic Panther is my primary gaming computer. However, because it's been really hot right now and the garage has been very hot, I haven't been gaming on that very much. Also, my wife and I have been playing a good amount of Overwatch lately and Overwatch doesn't benefit very much from an ultra wide monitor, 21 by nine, it actually crops. Uh, what you see, so you get a better gameplay experience on 16 by 9 That said, the secondary purpose of that system is just to be uh, a pretty background system, which uh, it does more often than I game on it recently, but I do game on that system. Secondary system is this one right here, which is uh, affectionately known as the Godly Streaming PC, uh, which I built last year. It's got a 6950X and it handles capture, like I'm capturing this video that I'm shooting right now on that system. Uh, it can also do a bunch of transcoding. I use it to handle our weekly live show uh, that I do with Kyle, Awesome Hardware on Tuesday evenings. And this has two monitors. Uh, both of them are 2560 by 1440. And that's just to give me uh, plenty of working space to work with so that when I'm setting up stuff like this, I have screen space. Next question from Hawk1291. Paul, since you worked at Newegg, maybe you can answer this. Why do graphics card retailers typically show pictures of cards from every view, except for the ones most people will actually see it from? This is a very good question. And yes, I did used to work at Newegg, although I haven't worked there for quite a few years now. So what I'm saying now is based on historical knowledge and might not necessarily be true for what they do now, but Newegg, at least when I worked there, had a pretty awesome photo team and any product that came in, they would take photos of. So for example, this is a Asus uh, RX 580 and I'm pretty sure the photo team did the photos on this one just based on looking at them. And here they're actually thankfully at least giving you a shot of the back of the card and that's often very key. You often don't see this. Uh, and then here's maybe a shot of the side of the card but you're right, not the orientation that you would actually see it in. At least you can see some of the details like does it have an 8 pin or a 6 pin PCI Express graphics power connector. Now also when I worked there Newegg would sometimes get pictures directly from the manufacturer and I think, I'm not sure, but I think that is the case with this EVGA card. Uh, and here again, they're kind of showing you the side of it a little bit, but again, it's not at that right angle. And none of these pictures show the back of it. Like one of the things I would want to see first and foremost here, does it have a backplate? 
and you just can't tell by looking at these pictures. You'd have to go and look at reviews or something like that. So I guess I don't really have an answer for this question, just a bit of sympathy that I agree with you. And I will say that when I used to do videos on products at Newegg, I would be very careful to take like a graphics card and be like, here is the angle that most of you will be seeing this at. So there's, there's a look at that, right? And uh, hopefully that was helpful for people. Next question from NPC is kind of related. Uh, why are GPUs not made with the fans up and the PCB down? It's a very good question. Been asked many times before and uh, just sort of kind of makes sense. If you look at a graphics card and you assume hot air rises, that's usually how physics work, uh, you've got this solid plate on top preventing any air from going upwards, and then you have all of the cooling elements on the bottom with the fans. It would seem like it would kind of make more sense to have that facing up, at least so the heat could escape and go upwards. Here again, I don't have a full answer for you, but hopefully I can provide a bit of historical context to maybe explain some reasons why. So this is the expansion card entry on Wikipedia where it talks about expansion cards in computers throughout history and uh, PCI Express is the one that we all know and love right now because that's what most of us are using. Uh, there's also PCI, the predecessor to PCI Express. There's also AGP, which is an expansion uh, slot standard, specifically made for graphics cards in about 1996, but petered out in the mid to late 2000s because PCI Express took over. And there's, then there's even ISA. ISA predates PCI, and ISA has these big long slots, and if you have really old motherboards, then, then maybe you'll notice those. An interesting thing about ISA is, from what I can have been reading in my research, ISA cards actually had components on the top of them. If you look at the orientation here where the slot is, these are up on top. It seems to be that when they went from ISA to PCI, they switched that and they started putting the components on the bottom of the card rather than the top. Sorry, my video froze for a second there, but back to the point. When they switched from ISA to PCI, it seems like somebody somewhere along the line made the decision that the components should go on the bottom instead of the top, and that might have made sense at the time because the CPU is probably gonna generate the most heat in a computer at that time. Graphics cards, discrete graphics cards in particular, weren't really a thing at that point. So it wasn't until five to 10 years later that you suddenly had massive graphics cards that required more cooling, expanding beyond a single slot to two slots, and then you have the solution we have now, which is an established standard so that case manufacturers, motherboard manufacturers, and adding card manufacturers can all produce products that will have interoperability and work together, combined with this steady increase in GPU power draw and heat generation that has led to the solution that we have today, which is two and sometimes three slot cards that hang down below the PCB in an orientation that doesn't seem to make the most practical sense to us as PC builders. That said, there are a lot of cases that flip the script by flipping the entire motherboard tray upside down, so you can do that. If you wanna flip your graphics card upside down, of course, then you have the CPU on the bottom, which introduces kind of a different issue, but then at least, as the previous uh, commenter mentioned, you can get a good look at the actual uh, functional part of your graphics card, which is often what you see in the ads. Next question is from Ben W. He says, I'm considering getting 144 hertz 1080p monitors for my 1050 Ti. So question being, can a 1050 Ti push 1080, uh, 1920 by 1080 to 144 hertz? Second, does G-Sync demand more from the GPU? So switching from a non-G-Sync standard 60 hertz monitor to a G-Sync monitor, does that actually affect the frame rate that your graphics card is able to put out? Short answer is no. Your graphics card can do a certain frame rate. If you have a 60 hertz monitor, you either have V-Sync on, which means it's gonna cap your frame rate to 60, or you have V-Sync off, which means it's gonna show you whatever frames are there and you might have to deal with some tearing. If you take that same configuration and plug it into a G-Sync monitor, the monitor will simply display every single frame that your GPU spits out, and it will not have any stuttering or tearing, and it is overall a better experience. So to answer that initial part of the question, no, G-Sync on versus G-Sync off will not affect the frame rate that your graphics card is able to put out at all. Second question, 1050 Ti with a 1080 144 hertz monitor is very much gonna depend on the game you're playing. If you're playing a game that's two, three, four years old and you have the settings turned down a little bit, you can probably hit at 1920 by 1080 a very high frame rate with a 1050 Ti, again, depending on the game that you're playing. 
And again, with a G-Sync monitor, that monitor is just going to display up to 144 frames per second, the exact amount of frames that your graphics card is able to put out. So even if you can't hit 144 frames per second or above with the game you're playing and a 1050 Ti, you still will get a benefit even if your graphics card is putting out 100 frames per second or 90 frames per second because it'll be smoother, you'll be seeing more frames, and you won't have any tearing that you deal with with a typical graphics card and monitor setup. That said, a G-Sync monitor is going to be very expensive, so you're going to be spending a lot on the G-Sync monitor compared to your 1050 Ti, so I would consider it more of an upgrade path to the future. Get the monitor now, game on it for a while with your 1050 Ti, and then probably plan to upgrade that 1050 Ti at some point in the future too. Next question from Mark andre B. Hey Paul, I game in my living room. I've been looking at HTPC cases, or cases that lay horizontally. That's pretty old school. Remember when computers used to lay on their side and you put your monitor on top of them? Uh, there seems to be very few cases, fewer new designs, and even fewer supporting full ATX motherboards. Is this from lack of demand? They all seem overpriced for such basic cases. Any recommendations? And yes, you are triggering me if you keep your PC on the floor. Especially like an, a horizontal HTPC style. That's just, there's so much dust getting in there. So build a stand for whatever case you get. But more to the point though, Silverstone uh, is generally my go-to for HTPC style horizontal HTPC cases. This is just a Google image search of them and you can see that they have lots of different varieties. Although again, there seems to be fewer of these now than there used to be in the past. That's not to say that there are none. And if you go over to Newegg and just look for Silverstone cases, you can see their vertical style cases, but you can also see some of their more horizontal-ish style cases if we scroll down. This one's very small, so maybe less practical. Here's the Vital Series SST VT02. That one also looks very small. If I actually search for HTPC here, we, we get only one actual answer. Although I believe this is a relatively new one, the SST GD04S. It does have USB 3 in the front. This is not full ATX though, it's micro ATX. But I think you're right. There are fewer of these cases now than there used to be. Um, cooling, I think, was not quite as effective as these as in tower style cases. And there's just fewer people doing DIY PC builds for a home theater use. I think because a lot of people just have a DVR that they get from their cable provider and then they just go with that. It's getting really hot in the garage though, so let me finish this video off. Last month I talked about GPU sag and quite a few people, including Vladex16, pointed out that Jay did a video explaining another method to fix GPU sag. Uh, Brian actually pointed out the video link and I've linked that in this video's description too. So feel free to watch that, but um, if you're interested in the short story, uh, when you have GPU sag like this, it can often be helped by providing further support to the brackets at the back of the GPU. And Jay did that by basically taking a screw, screwing it in through the back of the case to keep those from moving. And that uh, greatly improved his GPU sag situation. So there's another solution for you guys who might be looking for GPU sag. That doesn't work with every single case though. You have to have one that you can actually access that point to screw a screw into. Um, but one final note, if you guys like sending me stuff, feel free to do so. Paul's Hardware, PO Box 4325, Diamond Bar, California. If you guys want to send me stuff, we typically do mail time and open packages during Awesome Hardware, our live show on Tuesday evening. So thanks to all you guys who have sent me stuff there. Thanks to you guys for watching this video too. Hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more content coming at you very soon, including some actual, actual testing on Riptide back there behind me. Thanks again for watching, guys. We'll see you next time.